Three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for showing up tonight for our talk for uh, Dr. Candace uh, Tanner. Uh, we really appreciate her uh, being here and donating her time to give uh, the talk tonight. I also want to thank a few other people, uh, Marshall University in particular, uh, the College of Science and the Physics Department. They have always been fantastic um, helping out Society of Physics students and working alongside of us for outreach events and recruiting events. Um, and we really wanna thank them as well. We wanna thank the American Institute of Physics. Uh, they're also helping to co-sponsor this with our Marshall University chapter of physics students here. So we wanna thank them. Uh, and then a special thanks goes out to, to uh, Ellie White and Jackie Sizemore for uh, really doing a phenomenal job organizing this speaker series that started back in November. Um, and we've had roughly a speaker every month and they've done a really phenomenal job of organizing it and orchestrating it. Uh, so um, I really thank you guys for all the hard work that you do for SPS and, and the physics department. So the physics department here at Marshall has 10 faculty, six of those faculty are active in research. Um, so if you're a student that has uh, some interest in understanding how the physical world around you works, uh, feel free to email a, a physics faculty member. Uh, you can email me. My, my email is mcbrides at marshall.edu, and I can help guide you in the right direction. They do research from theoretical condensed matter physics to water filtration. Um, so if you're interested in some of those things, just reach out to me, and I'll help guide you in the right direction. Uh, Marshall has about 9,400 undergrad students and 2,800 uh, graduate students. Uh, we have an MS degree in physics, and we also have our BS degree with five areas of emphasis. We have an emphasis in biology, chemistry, uh, medical physics, uh, uh, medical imaging, and then we have our pure BS degree in physics. So we do offer uh, quite a few avenues for you to pursue depending upon what your interests are. So if you, like I said, have an interest in physics or you wanna discuss a minor in physics, just shoot me an email or email any one of our faculty in the physics department at Marshall and we'll be happy to help you. So I think with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ellie White and she's gonna introduce Dr. Candace Tanner. Yeah, thank you um, very much, Dr. McBride. Um, Marshall Physics Department is a great place. We're really lucky to be here. Um, so many thanks, of course, to everyone for coming tonight and happy St. Patrick's Day um, to those of you who celebrate. Um, so this will be as Dr. McBride mentioned, the fifth talk in our Faces of Physics series. And I know that we are all, and I am, really looking forward to learning about Dr. Tanner's cancer research and how she combines her expertise in physics and medical research to make amazing discoveries. And I'll be introducing her, her here really soon. Um, so after the presentation, I just wanted to mention, um, like the previous times, if you were here, you'll remember we have a question and answer session at the end. Um, and we welcome you to share your questions via the YouTube live chat or you can post your questions on Twitter by tagging us at MU Physics Club. Um, if you enjoyed this talk, um, we always hope you'll join us for future installments of the series. Um, so next month in April, we're going to have a researcher from WVU and radio astronomy expert, Pranav Sankavi, and he'll be speaking with us on April 12th. Um, his talk will be titled On Building Radio Telescopes from Radio Astronomy for Classrooms to Detecting Fast Radio Bursts, and more speakers will be advertised soon as well. Um, if you'd like to receive email updates about upcoming events, uh, we'll be sharing a link here in the YouTube description where you can go to sign up. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Candace Tanner. Um, so Dr. Tanner received her doctoral degree in physics at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign Urbana um, under the advisement of Professor Enrico Graton. She completed postdoctoral training at the University of California, Irvine, specializing in dynamic imaging of thick tissues. Um, she then became a Department of Defense Breast Cancer Postdoctoral Fellow jointly at University of California, Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory under Dr. Mina J. Bazell. Um, Dr. Tanner joined the National Cancer Institute as a Statman Tenure Track Investigator in July of 2012. Um, and there she integrates concepts from molecular biophysics and cell biology to learn how cells and tissues sense and respond to their physical microenvironment and to thereby design therapeutics and cellular biotechnology. She received tenure at NIH in 2020 um, for her work, she's been awarded the 2013 National Cancer Institute Director's Intramural Innovation Award, the 2015 NCI Leading Diversity Award, Federal Technology Transfer Award in 2016 and 2018, and the 2016 Young Fluorescence Investigator Award from the Biophysical Society, 
and she was named as a young innovator in cellular and molecular bioengineering in 2016 by the Biomedical Engineering Society. Um, so we're extremely honored to have such a distinguished guest with us this evening. And so without further talking for me, um, I'm really delighted to turn things over to her right now. Um, thanks again to all of you for coming and a huge thank you to Dr. Tanner for making the time to talk with, about her work with us today despite her busy schedule. Thank you so much for the invitation and thanks Ali. I think that was such a burden to kind of like read out all of these things. And I appreciate again, just the ability to share with you and I'm, I'm more than excited to, to participate and more importantly, I'm happy to address whatever questions you may have. So if I could share my screen and then change my pointer. So I, I put a title here, Physics of Cancer, and, and I think I'm gonna try to be about 30 minutes in length to leave time for questions. And essentially what I'd like to be able to do is understand, to pre present some concepts about what aspects of cancer we're focused in the lab and define a few terms so that everyone is on the same page. So I said as sort of like subtitle, what regulates metastasis? So let's define a few terms. So we we'll start from the framework of using these cartoons to describe the processes. So loosely, the metastasis is defined as the spread of cancer cells to distant organs. So if we bring our focus to the schematic, in blue, we have tumor cells or cancer cells. They arose from some genetic perturbations, sometimes environmental pressures, and these tumors form. And at some point, some cells are able to leave enter into conduits such as blood vessels and lymphatics, survive within these conduits, re-emerge to form these secondary lesions. Now, as I mentioned, in terms of what drives this progression of metastasis, uh, we have a fair understanding of some genetic perturbations or environmental perturbations that are responsible. But yet in itself, we, we come from the perspective of why are these tumor cells able to leave and colonize organs that have distinct properties. So let's define them from the point of view of this schematic. Here we have now cutaneous melanoma, which arises from transformed melanocytes. And within skin microenvironment, these cells are able to interact with other types of cells, such as fibroblasts, um, immune cells, extracellular matrix components. But the idea I wanna take away is that in addition to these interactions, they receive cues that are physical of nature within the organ environment if we define the organ as having a physical property. One such property is mechanical properties. So within this primary environment, these cells will respond to these types of cues. In a second, I'll describe how do they do so. But yet cancer cells have the ability to be malleable, that they can adopt um, and adapt to a new environment where in schematic on your right, these cells can then colonize the brain where not only cell types, so glial cells, astrocytes are present, different types of matrix components, hyaluronic acid, for example, is present in the brain that's not found in the primary site but also the brain has a different mechanical property compared to that of the primary tissue. So why are tumor cells able to be such adaptable to these different types of microenvironments? So the question is, how do we model this? We'd like to be able to understand how cells interact with the environment and from the perspective of, of how do they modulate these different cues to be able to survive. So many uh, groups, including my own, use 3D culture systems to recreate these environmental um, self in interactions. So here we're looking at a cell and its nucleus is labeled in blue. Uh, the cell is able to interact with its now matrix components. So collagen type one is one of those types of matrices in vivo, found in vivo. And as you could see that cells don't sit passively within these microenvironments. They're able to generate forces. They're able to remodel. You see deformation in the extracellular matrix in red. You see that these, the network architecture is changing and all of these things can be then calculated using physical formulas. So people have done things such as changing the matrix composition, changing matrix stiffnesses. They've changed the types of cells that you put in. And you could even put organoids in where these are now chunks of tissue 
that could then recreate these organ-like environments. But there's one aspect that we can't recreate simply with these three-dimensional culture systems. And that if we go back to the schematic, that these sort of physical barriers uh, are sort of like found along the metastatic cascade in that within these conduits, blood flow will impart shear forces. And the thing that I want you to take away from this is that these types of physical cues also relate to the cellular decisions that influence um, their cell fates. So what do I mean by that? I mentioned that genetic perturbations are important in terms of drive and malignancy. But in the last 10 years or so, the fact that physical cues such as mechanical properties and architectural cues are just as important and just as potent as these genetic perturbations in drive and malignancy. So let's bring it forward to this framework. So this field is known as mechanobiology and loosely speaking, we define cells as having as being mechanical entities. And we're going to define what we mean by viscally elastic in terms of their physical mechanical properties. As you saw from that movie that I showed you of the three dimensional culture, cells can generate contractile forces that are exerted on surrounding matrices, surrounded on other cells. And this in turn then can change the architectures on the order of either bundling fibers or making these fibers straight on the order of microns. And then that in turn changes the mechanical property of the tissue. And these have been shown to modulate directly things that are important for gene expression, all the way to slow processes such as cell migration. So from the perspective of length scales and temporal scales, let's, let's pay attention to a few things. Cells are the order of microns. Typical cell mammalian cells are about 10 to 15 microns in diameter. The forces that they generate can be piconewtons up to nanonewtons. Remodeling can take place over the course of a few microns in length to hundreds of microns, depending on how many forces, what type of cell is generated and what type of matrix. And then tissue in itself has an order of like hundreds of, of microns to millimeters. But yet this fantastically complex system regulates cellular processes, gene expression, which is relatively fast, to cell migration, which is on the order of hours to, to well, several minutes to hours in terms of the average speed. So how do we then deconvolve this in a manner that then is applicable for a cancer? So we had a few goals when we started these projects. One is that we, we wanted to use our three-dimensional culture systems that give us a lot of flexibility, but also come up with a system that allows us to incorporate these forces that I spoke about in terms of traveling within conduits and encountering different types of barriers as they leave their primary tumor. We want to be able to do this in a living animal. So that's what we mean by intravital. We like to visualize with single cell resolution, the ability of uh, these cells to colonize these different um, systems. And more importantly, quantitate some meaningful uh, things such as how these cells um, change their phenotypes and genotypes in vivo. These are two future goals that we are still pursuing, but today I'm gonna to talk to you about the first one. So there's one more thing I need to tell you about metastasis. Um, no surprise, cancer is complicated, right? So I mentioned that metastasis describes the process by which these tumor cells can leave a primary site to colonize a distant organ, but the sites at which these cells are able to colonize are non-random. So this was first followed by um, Paget, who was a pathologist in the late 19th century. And following breast cancer patients or autopsy, he likened tumor cells to seeds, to the organs that he found metastatic lesions as soil or fertile soil. And only if these two were compatible would you have a secondary region being formed. This has since been shown now to be conserved for other types of solid tumors, and in this schematic, we see that some subtypes of prostate cancer, uh, once these cells have left its primary site, preferentially colonize the bone. Whereas lung and breast cancer are fairly promiscuous in that they can colonize bone, liver, lung, and brain, albeit with different latencies as given by the length of the arrow. So we'd like to be able to not only recreate this aspect, but use our, have a model system 
that allows us to test the role of physical properties in defining these parameters. So we're gonna try to address this question, how did tumor cells select the secondary site? So I mentioned we needed a new model system to recreate these physiologically relevant forces. And what we've been doing in the last five years or so is using zebrafish as our model system. Before I play the movie, what I want you to orient you is this eye here should actually be here. Um, we have introduced human breast cancer cells directly into the circulation system of, of zebrafish. And these are uh, amenable to genetic engineering. So uh, these, cell, these fish are actually, their blood vessels light up with a fluorophore, GFP, and the immune cells are also labeled with a fluorophore um, so that we could follow in real time how these cells move with respect to the blood vessels as well as immune system. But one of the benefits of using zebrafish before I play this movie is not only do we uh, visualize these rare and fast processes, we could follow the same uh, fish for several days and look how these cells divide in these different organs. So let me play the movie. If you now look at the left, what you're observing is that these cancer cells, these are human cancer cells, are able to adopt different types of strategies within the brain of the zebrafish. So let's focus on a few insights. On the bottom, you're seeing that a human cancer cell has the ability to already surf along the blood vessels, similar to what has been postulated in, a, in real humans. And more importantly, on the right, you could physically catch these cells as they leave the blood vessels that enter directly into the brain. Here you see one cell squeezing its way in through the brain cavity followed by a second one. Just a note, these things are very rare and, and hard to visualize even in mouse models. So the zebrafish system allows us to have the single cell resolution. But that's not enough. Remember I told you the complexity of being able to understand this non-random organ selectivity. We're putting human cells in zebrafish. And while zebrafish share homology in that what defines a zebrafish brain and mammalian brain are relatively well conserved, the reality is that we need to demonstrate this aspect. Secondly, I told you in, the sense, in this sort of forward wheel that uh, mechanobiology indicates that biophysical cues in itself can direct cell fate decisions. But we need to be able to measure what does a cell see in vivo? What does it matter for cell in that context? Not what we could measure. Again, it's always what does a cell see in order to make these types of decisions. Finally, we have to do some biology in the sense that we could measure these cues, but if cells don't have the machinery to receive them, they're largely blind to them. So we need to define um, key proteins that allow cells to sense these cues. And based on that information, can we possibly change organ targeting by some genetic manipulation? Okay, so what did we do? There are triple negatives. So these are human cancer cells such that once you introduce them into mice, they show this non-random selectivity that I mentioned, where the 231BR or brain targeting preferentially colonizes the brain, whereas the 231 bone marrow targeting preferentially colonizes bone marrow of mice. So we took these cells and we introduced them directly into the circulation system of zebrafish, and we simply quantified because we have single cell resolution, how many cells are present in the brain, how many have extravasated. Conversely, we use the quarter vascular plexus as our bone marrow niche at this age of the fish. So what did we find? We found that for fish that were injected with this brain targeting variant, we observed that many cells are present within the brain. To orient you, this is the eye of the fish. We're looking at the vasculature of the cancer cells in blue. So five days post introducing directly into the circulation system, these cells have extravasated into the brain successfully. Conversely, when we look at the brains of fish where bone marrow targeting cells were introduced, these fish are largely devoid of cells. But we need to make sure that this is real non-random selectivity. So we could look at, oops, we could look at the cordovascular plexus niche, which is our bone marrow variant. And for the brain targeting, we observe that there are cells that are present, but they're largely dead when we look for apoptotic markers. Whereas bone marrow targeting, not only have they extravasated, 
but they've now proliferated. And this has also been confirmed. It's important that not just for these um, pair, this pair of cell lines, another pair of mouse mammary cancer, triple negative breast cancers, um, mammary cancers, do we see it? same behavior. So now that we've confirmed that this non-random selectivity is conserved in the zebra fish, the question then is like, how do we define these biophysical cues? So let's go through this. This is really a busy slide, so let's walk through. When cells move within conduits that are comparable in size to their widths, depending on the architecture of these conduits, they can direct different types of migration strategies, as well as differences in their gene expression. So in this top, we see that the conduits are comparable in size, but this one would see more of a linear microenvironment compared to this is more tortuous. We're gonna discuss that in more details later on. The second thing is we talked a lot about how cells sense cues and the, micro the physical properties of the microenvironment, one aspect being mechanical properties. You need to be able to measure this directly in vivo. So what my lab did is we built an optical tweezer setup and for those of you who had won the Nobel Prize in Physics a few years ago, Ashkin was the person who really showed the feasibility of using this, set, um, this technique. And essentially we use near infrared light here safely at depths of 500 microns in axial resolution. And we're using our near infrared light to apply forces here where we're trapping this blood cell and moving it at will with our technique. I'm gonna show you how we could use this then to pull out the mechanical properties of the tissue in vivo. Finally, we, we need to be able to image with single cell resolution fast enough resolutions to check things like blood flow, okay? Because these cells are not moving within conduits that are devoid of, of blood and these cells will be moving at physiological um, rates. So we need to be able to differentiate cell migration from that of the underlying um, physiology of the, of the zebrafish. And finally, we use microfluidics as a gut check. So here we are using the um, blood vessels of the brain and the cardiovascular plexus as our mask. And we're using microfluid devices to make sure that what we observe in vivo is really conserved for human-human interactions. So within these vessel masks, we put human proteins such that we could compare what these cells would behave like in these similar architectures to that of our in vivo system, okay? So going back to this metastatic cascade, um, now in terms of what is known for single cell dissemination, we have these five steps. In zebrafish, obviously we don't have a primary tumor. So we are not gonna be able to follow this intravasation process, meaning when the cells have left. Instead, we're gonna be able to address from latter stages of the metastatic cascade, namely when these cells are within circulatory transit, if they extravasate, and more important, survival into superenchymal. So we're gonna ask the question, at what, what's the rate level step to drive this non-random selectivity? So do the cells move differently, right? So one thing we need to be able to go back is like, what aspects are we looking at and how comparable is this to mammalian systems? So I'd like to look at you now, this is a tiled image of an entire fish. And you can see diversity of the architectures that we observe in the brain and cordovascular plexus, bone marrow niche, and these intersegmental vessels. And when we quantify the vessel widths at these ages at which we introduce these cancer cells, we get values about 12 microns on average. And this is simply the histogram to show you the distribution. But suffice to say, this is comparable to what others have measured in a human um, mammary capillary bed. So what I want you to take away from this is that fish is a massive capillary bed. So that's the stage of metastasis that we're focusing on. And it's, it's important to note that this is thought to be circular, um, arresting capillary beds is thought to be one of the launching pads for metastasis, okay? So we have to be careful, and this is some image of processing I'd like to be transparent about. Fish is growing at the same time that we're introducing these cancer cells. So I simply want to show you that we do some registration so that we can differentiate underlying migration from that of morphogenesis, okay? So we then compared with our registered images, the migration of these cells in vivo with that of our human-human microfluid devices. And we simply asked, are the cells that, that colonize the brain, do they migrate differently to that of cells that colonize the bone marrow? 
So we quantify these data, just to remind you here, we have the brain in vivo, the in vitro memetics. And largely, if we compare the average speed between these two cell types, they don't have differences in migration strategies in vivo or in vitro. So it's not that they're migrating differently um, in terms of drive this non-random selectivity. So the next thing we ask is, well, if they could migrate e equally to each of these different organs, do they survive differentially once they get there? And largely they don't. There's no difference, I mean, in the sense that if we do a co-injection directly into the brain and so forth, there is no difference. So it leaves us with extravasation. So let's try to examine if this is one of the steps that drives this sort of non-random selectivity. So as I mentioned before that when cells are, tumor cells are circulating in the bloodstream, that arresting capillary beds are important in terms of the um, steps to form a metastasis. So on your right here, you're looking at a, a zoomed in image of a human breast cancer cell with zero fish material cells tightly wrapped. So if we go back to this metric of the fact that cells can sense cues from the microenvironment and modulate these processes, we simply ask, are the mechanical properties of the tissue in, within these different organs comparable? So this goes back, I've been talking a lot about mechanical properties, but what do, do I mean? And before I play this um, uh, movie, I want you to pretend for a second that this pink oobleck fluid that I'm showing you is going to be the equivalent of this cell talking to the extracellular matrix proteins. And the finger is the cell's protrusion in being able to receive these cues. Oops. I forget, I have to take off my laser because this is not automatic. So again, the cell's protrusions is the finger. And you could see at one length scale, one finger, at one temporal scale, the ECM behaves more like a liquid. But then if the cell, again, we're, we're, we're pretending that this is a cell interrogating the matrix environment, now interacts with the same flu um, fluid um, material at a different frequency, same length scale, you see that it behaves more like a solid. So this is a complexity that we're trying to resolve and this is important from a biological point of view because life occurs at different frequencies. And this one kilohertz should be up here. Okay, so suffice to say that all of these different cellular processes occur at these different length scales with iron channel gates and being one of the fastest processes. So it's important for us to know exactly what the mechanical property is at the right length scale at, and also at the right temporal scale. So how do we do this? So I mentioned that we are able to use our optical tweezers safely in vivo, and we inject one micron diameter bead shown here in blue, and then we're able to apply our optical tweezer setup such that we could sweep, do a frequency sweep from three hertz to 15 kilohertz. So by applying these local deformations, these local forces, we could then infer from the underlying deformation of the material with some calibration steps, what the underlying mechanical properties are with micron resolution. And I like to tell people, some people are aficionados, this is how long it takes for us to take a measurement for each speed. So what did we find? Well, we didn't find anything that was so exciting. Any sense that, yes, it's exciting to measure directly in vivo, but at the age, so this bottom graph here, um, what we observed is like largely the mechanical properties at the apical surfaces of the brain and the CVP are comparable. I'm not showing you the lost tangent that tells you how liquid-like or solid-like the behavior is. And there should be a magnitude I'm missing my bars here. Suffice to say, at the age at which we introduce mechanical properties at that stage are comparable, but just for our understanding, the material does stiffen as a function of age where the brain is two thirds as, as, as rigid as that of the cordovascular plexus niche. So if it is that the mechanical properties at least at that age are comparable, the blood flow is comparable, uh, the circulation transit, they can migrate similarly. Let's go back to another aspect of the vessel architecture that may be important. And by eye, you could see there's a diversity in architecture. So what we did is we calculated 
what types of environment that these cells would use based on the intensity from these micrographs. We came up with something like an order parameter where the more tortuous the behavior of the, um, the tortuous the material properties, we could then label that to something more uh, closely related to zero versus something more linear would be closer to one. So based again on the length scale, here comes the cat. <laughs> based again on the length scale at which we observe uh, what a cell would sense, we observe that the bone marrow niche is more chaotic than at the brain than that of the intersegmental vessels. And for completeness, we, we provide this histogram. So we are left with the vessel organization is distinct, but not the mechanics, at least at the age at which we introduce these cells. So the question then, could this be important to facilitate this capillary arrest? And so let's explain what was done on the y-axis here. We're looking at how many cells arrived within the different organs. And simply we calculate how many cells remain stuck after 12 hours to collect this ratio. On the x-axis, you see in here that the two isogenic pairs of uh, brain and bone marrow targeting. And we also introduced 10 micron beads, 10, mi 10 micron diameter beads as a control. And the reason why we do so is that beads should not have a receptor that could sense these cues. And what we observed is independent of cell type or these beads, that these uh, entities preferentially get stuck in these chaotic stages. So just a passive architectural cue is sufficient to drive this. But we observed that there's this non-random selection where brain, go, brain targeting goes to brain, bone marrow targeting goes to bone marrow. So why is it then most of them get stuck regardless of, of this sort of phenotype? And this again goes back to the question that cells have to have the machinery to sense the cues. So we have to ask, do these cells have the same machinery to sense these physical cues? And suffice to say, they don't. When we did proteomic analysis, so this involves simply grinding up cells and be able to read out what proteins are present, uh, we observed that an integrin beta-1, a protein that allows cells to attach and receive cues from the matrix, one of these proteins are upregulated in cells at home to the bone compared to cells at home to the brain, and myosin 1b, the converse is true. So I'm just gonna show you data for the myosin 1b in the interest of time. So we silenced, so we did some genetic engineering where we could reduce these levels of myosin 1b in these cells and then reintroduce them into the cells and compare them to a scramble control. Uh, schematically, how this is quantified, we look at how many cells are present only in the bone marrow niche, quarter vascular plexus, how many are present in both organs and how many present on the brain. And these are just pie charts to quickly summarize the data. And suffice to say, when we silence myosin 1b, we're able to shift the cell's ability to colonize the brain and now go to the bone marrow based on that observation of a physical property. But the story doesn't end there. Once you do this in a zebrafish, you go back to a mouse to test. And what we found is that when we silence mice in 1B and introduce in mice, we also observe less brain metastasis. So this was for us exciting that we could come up with a new theory just simply based on physical properties. So I hope that I've convinced you so far that this non-random selectivity that um, is sort of like a big problem for us in, in cancer research, zebrafish could begin to address some of these questions in a single cell manual. Um, the fact that the vessel architecture itself can just direct organ targeting is important and, and first defined here because in many organs in mammalian systems, we have this chaotic types of vasculature and it's important to understand what the organ vessel architecture itself can facilitate metastasis. As I mentioned, we were surprised that just using these simple principles, we could pull out novel regulators of brain um, colonization, um, brain metastasis remains of a great clinical need. And just by using that information, be able to shift sites of colonization. So I'd like to end with the following. We started by talking about Paget and his seed and soil hypothesis. But what's less understood and less studied is the mechanical hypothesis in that the vasculature in terms of both its architecture and blood flow patterns can also facilitate 
um, this non-random selectivity. So we believe that zebra fish now allows us to test this hypothesis in greater detail than had been done previously because of the ability to single cell resolution and perturbation. And with that, I don't do lab work anymore in the last year or so, um, except some of those images I actually did take. But I'd like to be able to thank the people who actually did the work. So Colin Paul is the postdoc and a postback Alexis Devine. They're the ones who started the zebrafish. So Alexis came and did her gap year before going on. And she was really instrumental in getting this work up and running. I didn't get to talk about what uh, the others in the lab are doing today, but I'd still like to thank them publicly because the pandemic has been hard. And I know that they're working as hard as they can given the circumstances. I'd like to thank the funding and the collaborators that I didn't talk about today, but nevertheless, um, give valuable insight and advice. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Dr. Tanner. That was very insightful. So we'll, we'll move on to the question and answer session. Um, so all of you viewers out there, if you wanna type your questions into the YouTube chat, or you can tweet at MU Physics Club on Twitter if you have questions there as well. So while I'm waiting for you guys to type out your questions, I just wanna remind you of our fundraiser to help fund the honoraria for our speakers. Um, we are giving away a 45 quart Getty cooler. Um, and if you make a donation to the Society of Physics Students, we can enter you for a chance to win that Yeti cooler. So summer's coming up pretty soon. Uh, you might wanna use that to go camping or something. Uh, I know I would really like to have something like that with me. So if you're interested in uh, donating to the Society of Physics students, either to enter for a chance to win that Yeti cooler, or if you just wanna donate and you, you're not interested in the Yeti cooler, um, you can email me or Dr. McBride um, yeah, I'll put, I'll put our emails in the uh, YouTube chat bar um, at the end of the talk. So we don't have any questions yet. So Ellie or Dr. McBride, did you guys have any questions you wanted to go ahead and share? Yeah, so I had um, one just, uh, you were mentioning um, how, how you guys were basically able to um, isolate um, the different regulators um, that uh, were, and I apologize, I'm not a biologist, so I'm going to get all the terms wrong, <laughs> but um, where um, you're able to identify the way that you made um, the cells, uh, the cancer cells basically not transmit, transfer to the brain. Um, you identified the regulator that kind of um, caused that. Um, does that translate to like, um, the way that does that translate to like an invention of a like a medicine that can prevent cancer spreading to areas like the brain or things like that or is that really complicated okay so that's the question right so i should have mentioned earlier that even with all of the advances predicting sites are still um less than ideal in terms of the um, patient patient variability so one of the things that we'd like to do building on this myosin 1b finding um, one is to find a mechanism. So while it was exciting to see that um, this is tied to how cells sense a physical cue, for us to be able to come up with a, a therapeutic, like you mentioned, one is like, we have to do it with many different cell types. So we only did it with two pairs of cell lines um, and then be able to understand along the cascade, uh, um, I mean, along the um, signaling cascade, um, how does it work? So does myosin 1B then regulate a transcription factor that in, in terms of the nucleus and then what proteins and so any temporal and then be able to stop this process, right? So what I hope to convey to you today is that just by using these preclinical models, by measuring these two, uh, using our tools from physics, we could screen multiple or, or try to find multiple targets that could then be pushed forward to, to be able to define these therapeutics. But I just hope that I, I convey to you that the step from here, preclinical to clinical, in order to assess toxicity and so forth is, is a pretty large gap, but we have to start somewhere because the reality is that we're still not um, at a case where we have effective therapies for metastasis. 
um, because in 90% of patients that present with metastasis, unfortunately, will succumb to their disease. Okay, so we, we still have a long way, but in itself, even if we understand like maybe that we don't um, read, if we could redirect uh, tumor cells ability to colonize organs that are more either surgically accessible or in a sense that they are less um, detrimental to quality of life. You could, one could imagine that a brain metastasis is, is not a site of metastasis that one would want um, for obvious reasons that brain is controlling many functions. So these are the things that we're hoping to do. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. McBride, did you have anything you wanted to ask? Uh, so on the one image, you were able to show that the cells were traveling, uh, the cancer cells were traveling on the bloodstream. Was that correct? correct? So when they entered the brain, uh, how did, what pathway did they take? Because um, I thought there was a, a, obviously my biology skills are not coming in to hand uh, either, but um, I thought there was a blood uh, barrier there. So what size are we talking about that they were able to get in and maybe penetrate through that? No, so you're absolutely right. The blood brain barrier has to be breached mm -hmm. um, for these cells to be able to colonize. So in the images that I showed you, the blood-brain barrier may not be fully intact. But in, in, in other um, later studies, we've introduced these tumor cells when the blood-brain barrier is um, intact. And we don't quite understand the mechanism yet. We could see that they physically force through um, the blood-brain barrier. But the question remains, is it that they're secreting a factor that will then transiently open the blood-brain barrier? Or are they actively like punching a hole? Because um, sometimes what we observe is that the cells are wronged up and then physically squeeze. And then there's a hole that uh, occurs in these endothelial endothelial uh, and then close up immediately after the cell gets in. So these are things that are still, um, these are big questions we feel. But the, the caveat I just want to leave you with is we have to ensure that even the phenomenon by which these cells breach the zebrafish endothelium, in terms of if it's a force that's required or if it's a factor, we need to make sure these things are conserved in a mammalian system. Meaning does the tight junctions, is that strength comparable to a mammalian system, right? So these are the things that we could do with in vitro studies, but quite frankly, the zebrafish allows us the flexibility of studying these things in greater detail because we have the single cell resolution. So you're quite correct with that. That's a good point. I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Well, it doesn't look like we have any questions from the audience. So without further ado, thank you very much, Dr. Tanner. And uh, thank you for everyone who's watching. Um, hope you guys have a great rest of your week and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you.